Hi everybody, the uh, purpose of this lecture um, is to basically um, take us through Latin America for most of the 19th century. Not all of it, um, like, you know, it'll take us to like the 1880s or so, um, from about like 1830 or so, so about 50 years or so. Um, and it's one of those things that like, much like Napoleon and stuff like that, it's not like a one day lecture that's gonna be delivered. It's like one of those things that like, I'll have it all in this video right here, but in class we'll do like three slides, we'll do an activity or or something like that we'll do like another three slides or so we'll do another so it'll take us like a week week and a half to get through this whole thing but like it's still like in one file here um and it's titled industrialism and latin america and you'll notice that the ampersand or the and there is underlined and bolded because it's not industrialism in latin america like it is industrialism in europe or something like that it's industrialism and latin america and the end result is something that we call like you know kind of post-colonial blues liberalism its failures as that happens um progress and then eventually kind of neo colonialism and the great export boom um, and what you're looking at um, and and this is the reason this gives you the perfect example of why we teach Europe Ian, and Latin American history together because um, what you're looking at um, is a uh, is Buenos Aires um, and the picture in gray is Buenos Aires from about like 1870 1880 or so um, and then the picture down there is a picture I took um, in Buenos Aires in uh, 2018 um, same same area like one from above and one from uh, you can actually see the statue in the two of them um, one from above and one a panorama right there I'm um, at the far end you see the little that large pink thing is actually called the pink house that's where the president of argentina lives um but uh but buenos aires is actually a city that even today has a higher percentage of europeans in it um than uh london for example um of ethnic europeans and stuff like that um and in europe and latin america have always um been very tied together but the other thing we've also seen is that latin americans have always been very kind of like at least until recently very like you know um kind of secondary to europeans they end up uh you know not getting like you know the rich might like kind of be as as, as marty would call in this kind of he'd call them slaves to latin america or sorry to european fashion ideas culture etc etc they didn't feel like they developed their own um ideas and stuff like that um and so like on top of that um that's also the way it happens like from economics and politics and stuff like that um and that's what happens here is that everything is taken from um the latin america brought to europe made better etc cetera, etc cetera. um and then like the latin americans at least the argument here is that that in, in in buenos aires and places like that instead of like being frustrated with that and by developing their own um ideas they instead like tried to make themselves as european as possible to try to get past that and that, that's part of what this will argue um and if you've been to europe you can see the architecture is very 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 similar um, and one thing that we'll talk about later on that Matheny and I found was like you know um, uh, once uh, once you get into like Latin America not like the Caribbean and stuff like that but like Cuba well Cuba's part of the Caribbean is kind of an exception but then um, Mexico City and South and stuff like that you get a very very European feel when you're traveling and etc etc et and you can see kind of the ties of the cultures and stuff like that okay so what essentially so um, ties in cultures aside and, and stuff like that and kind of like giving you a further comparison as to why these are linked and stuff like that. Um, what this um, thesis is going to be arguing or this lecture is going to be essentially arguing is that um, post-revolutionary Latin America, because you remember where we left off, um, everything but Cuba was quote unquote free and everything but Cuba as well as Brazil, it actually had a fairly major revolution. Um, Mexico, the Bolivarian revolutions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So post-revolutionary Latin American governments tried, um, but didn't have the political and social backing to make the change they wanted. And instead of becoming um, modern liberal states like they'd seen happen in parts of um, like Europe as well as the United States and stuff like that, they instead kind of like lapse back into conservative rule. Um, and and then what we have is this really kind of like horrible cycle for the next like you know 50 years that this is going to talk about where you've got liberals who are in power and they try to rig elections and are fairly successful till people get pissed off and the conservatives get into power and they stay in power and try to rig elections until people get really pissed off for 20 years and then liberals get into back into power and and stuff like that um liberal and, and so like liberalism tried to turn the tide and benefit the people um however like you know it wasn't a benefit to the actual people they put forward ideas of like you know in industry, free trade, progress, social class, and instead what happened, and this is what I was part getting at, at um, people like Marty saying that the rich kind of became like, you know, um, very like uh, enslaved by European culture ideas, um, uh, uh, politics, economics, etc., etc. What happened was the rich got really, really rich. They stayed rich just, just like you saw, just like in a... Uh, um, 
in like European history and stuff like that, as well as like, you know, as they kind of exploited the poor and stuff like that. Um, and they curtailed the rights of the lowest classes. Um, and, and basically like consigning Latin America to a place where you had a bunch of really, really rich people, a bunch of really, really poor people that work for them and everything that was not like, you know, um, you know, that, that wasn't like raw materials, like Brazil produced a bunch of coffee, stuff like that. But like, you know, for example, like all the, all the raw materials that were needed to, to actually produce more complex production and stuff like that, that stuff went, um, uh, to, to back to Europe or to the Americas. And it, it resigned Latin America to a, um, not a producer of, of like important goods and services, but rather just a supplier of materials, much like Asia or Africa, um, as a result of this kind of continual fighting and this inability of liberalism and stuff like that to bring itself down to the lowest classes. Instead, the, the rich just continued supplying materials and continued kind of being engrossed by Europe, if that makes sense. Okay, um, so the first thing I want to talk about... Um, is like you know the immediate impact of the revolutions because in order to fully understand this we've got to go back to like to like right after mexico right after bolivar stuff like that uh, and if you remember um in that um you know bolivar had had mexico had put in a, a liberal democracy to begin with um bolivar had said like you know hey maybe we shouldn't like you know give everybody the right to vote but that wasn't super popular um, especially after what was happening um, in America, in France, and other places in Europe where, like, more and more people were getting the right to vote. So this idea of, like, you know, Bolivar is like, hey, let's give people a little bit before they have... No, that wasn't popular. Like, instead, like, you know, democracies are put into place in, in Latin America, like, when this first happens. Um, but they're put into place, like, they're kind of forced into place in societies that, for lack of a better word, haven't, like, fully, like formed and evolved them, if that makes sense. In other words, like, there is still a really close tie of the church to the state. And then all of a sudden, when you put these democracies in, um, culturally, there's a close tie in Latin America. Even today, there's a close tie in Latin America, actually. Um, but, like, you know, at that time, like, you, the, culturally, is a real, I mean, then you put in these democracies that are like, you know, um, hey, there will be complete and total freedom of religion, and this church will have nothing to do with the state, and blah, blah, blah. And instead of, like, a slow evolution of that over time, has kind of happened, like, in France or the United States or, like, a slow evolution followed by, like, a really big jolting event like the French Revolution or the American Revolution. But the point is, is there had been, like, you know, discussion and thought and stuff like that. Instead, what happens in Latin America is that really hadn't entered into the picture. Um, and all of a sudden, it's just, like, poof, plop down. And, like, that that happens with the church, that happens with economics, that happens with, like, you know, various freedoms and stuff like that into what are more traditional societies. OK. Um, and instead, what you get is like reactions to some of these societal reforms. OK, like when the elections come around, conservatives make like, you know, hey, we've lost our church. The big issue. Right. Like, you know, and on top of that, what's happened is that like, you know, um, it's not like the economics have gotten that better during the revolutions, like, you know, the Bolivarian revolutions and stuff like that. The Creoles had like, you know, um, <clears throat> promised everything would get better and everybody would be able to rise up and blah, blah, blah. And instead what really happened was that the Creoles like basically kicked the Peninsulars out and then to take over like, you know, um, most of like the land and stuff like that. They mainly invest in land. They don't end up like trading a ton because they've just kicked the Peninsulars out and they want to kind of set up their own individual countries and stuff like that. But they don't do a fantastic job of it because like at all times when faced to like employ and give more rights to like the lower classes they usually decide to take more land and money from themselves and in the end over like a period of time um <coughs> um the uh the like creoles basically like replace the peninsulars um as far as like the hierarchy goes without a whole lot of like hardcore change okay and the end result is by like the 1850s or so 18 18 sorry 1840s 1850s um which is about like 20 years later um virtually all governments um were legally or illegally overthrown in favor of traditional conservative rule um and there weren't like revolutions when i say legally overthrown there might have been like you know in mexico for example there was an election that people just won um um, in other places, there were elections that were rigged one way or the other, and that becomes very, very common. And what this leads to is this phenomenon um, in Latin America um, known as the rise of caudillos. Okay. Now, 
Um, Claudio is um, a party leader who's achieved virtual dictatorial rule. If you've ever heard of Santa Ana in um, Mexico, that's an example. We're going to talk about um, Juan Manuel de Rosas in um, Argentina. Um, they kind of popped up um, throughout large parts of Latin America. Uh, they usually, like much like somebody like Napoleon, and, and Napoleon has some elements of Claudioism to him, um, but much like, um, but not entirely, nowhere near as, as, as strong as this and stuff like that. Uh, much like Napoleon, they generally came to power through some type of legal election and then they like at that point decided that they were going to like you know basically rig things and change things and stuff like that um they're usually an upper middle class creole quite often a war hero um and this is the big thing is they 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 usually have traditional machismo qualities so like a general or a ladies man or a strong man or something like that usually as i said fairly rich but with a quote-unquote knack for communication with like the lower classes and stuff like that okay um and then what they do once they get in power is through things like you know patronage politics which is like hey you know you helped me get elected so now i'm gonna give you this key position here blah blah blah, blah make you head of like this agency or whatever um blah blah blah, blah. um thanks to like that and kickbacks they're, they're able to stay in power um and they tend to use like propaganda and like a combination of hard and soft power to like extract votes and that means like ostracization as well as like you know beating people up and stuff like that so like for example if we take like juan manuel de rosas like right um it's uh it's one of those things that like you know his red ribbons um the rosistas or his not red ribbons sorry his followers as they become known as the rosistas um, they like on one day, I don't know, let's pick a day, like Tuesday, they all wore like red ribbons, right? And everybody's wearing a red ribbon outside in Buenos Aires is like cool. And those who aren't wearing a red ribbon, they like, you know, rough up or they might beat up a little bit or they might like, you know, eventually if this happens over a number of times and they're really trying to get them to support DeRosas, they might like actually like threaten them or stuff like that. And so, or, or like physically attack them or stuff along those lines. So like, you know, um, that's what I mean by like, you know, um, a combination of like, you know, um, some coercion and soft power, some like, you know, just kind of pushing, but then also some hard power. And then also like, you know, the invention of, of things like secret police, um, et cetera, et cetera, because Derosis did have his, um, his own secret police and, and stuff like that. Um, but, uh, but like Derosis, for example, came to power, um, because like the French and British tried to intervene in a few things. The British have always had a little thing with Argentina, especially with their islands. They have the Malvinas or Falkland Islands, whatever you want to call them. Um, but, uh, but they, uh, the French and British tried to intervene in Argentina some, and uh, De Rosas had been the like general who kicked them out and then he came into politics and he got his followers and then at that point like they were able to like legally like become like you know um uh, what was I going to say? They were legally able to become president, and after that happened, his followers became a little bit more violent. He sets up a little bit of secret police. He kind of gets rid of political opposition and exiles intellectuals. Um, but, you know, at the time, like, you know, he puts up protectionist trade laws and, like, curtails freedom of the press. But Buenos Aires prospers because, like, you know, he's able to, like, tame some of the gauchos in the other lands because he is a strong man on the outside of Argentina, in which case, like, therefore trade's able to flow through parts of Argentina more. And so, like, people in Buenos Aires make more money and like they don't get like too upset they're not like you know overly happy about it but it's one of those things where like you might not be really overly happy like you like your freedom of pre spe uh, speech and stuff like that but on the other hand you're making money so most of the Creoles most of the people in power who could complain don't complain um, and this kind of continues for an extended period of time um, and the more protectionist trade laws he issues the more people in power keep their money um, stuff like that and like eventually it becomes kind of commonplace and everybody knows there's an election but it's kind of a joke you guys have seen this happen um, the thing that becomes unfortunate and by the way DeRosas is finally overthrown by a military coalition in 52 but that's how long he rules for is about 20 years or so the thing that becomes unfortunate through some of those cadillos is it becomes normalized in kind of the culture of some of these latin american countries um to like you know be tacitly okay with this and as a result of things like derosis and stuff like that we're going to see six different um coup attempts or six different like um, rebellions in argentina which lead to like temporary dictatorships um in the 20th century because like you know after you do this for long enough for enough generations and you have a few cadillos and he's not the only one he's just the when I use as the example in a few different places, then like, you know, people say, oh, okay, we've seen it before. It's not the worst thing in the world. It's not the best thing in the world, but why really fight it? Cause blah, blah, blah. And it slowly kind of becomes like tacitly like ingrained in culture, if that makes sense.
Here, by the way, is a uh, picture of Derosus. That is him right there. Um, these are uh, plaques from his actual tomb, which you can see um, in Recoleta Cemetery in Buenos Aires, as well as his like you know picture in like the Presidential um, uh, Museum and Palace and stuff like that. Um, he is still, I mean, considered like you know a president of Argentina despite all this. Now, the other thing I do find interesting, and this just gives you an idea about the importance of like taking care of your ancestors in Latin American culture, right? Is this picture of Derosus right here, which I use for years right I go to this tomb of Derosus and it just happens to be this is where everybody famous in, in Argentina is buried in Buenos Aires um, and you look down and like it is still being completely cared for there is still like a picture of like you know him that exact picture actually is right there like you know frame set in the center his like ancestors are like making sure that like you know he's still remembered and stuff along those lines so like it's just kind of an interesting cultural phenomenon Um, now, as I mentioned earlier, it's not like the Rosas was the only, like, Caudillo at this point, right? Um, and, like... Um, a lot of these like European countries and um, North American or at least American countries, America um, as the better way to put it sorry, these European countries and America um, saw this and um, they saw Claudia's and they realized that this was kind of weakening the state, it was weakening the infrastructures and they, they saw the opportunity at the height of, at like not at the height but at the time that industry and nationalism are starting to take height more and more they saw the opportunity to um, actually like, you know, at least um, hopefully directly but if not indirectly um, mess with and um, take control of some of these like Latin recently um, freed Latin American um, countries right if that makes sense um, and like the first one of the one of the key ones we need to talk about like this is the the Mexican American War um, because the US fakes an international incident um, there's this thing um, uh, that occurs um, near the US Mexico border at that time in Texas and Texas at the time is a uh, um, is uh, is actually um, um, you know in the process of rebelling and trying to get free from Mexico over the result of some of these um, recent like, political decisions and stuff like that. Um, and the U.S. claims that, like, um, that the Mexicans came in and they invaded the United States and there was a, a thing there. And there's actually this little upstart um, uh, congressman from Illinois um, in the House of Representatives who um, gets up in something called the Spotlet Resolution and he demands to like know the spot, the exact spot and where this was fired because it doesn't seem right to him. It seems wrong. It seems like that like this might be a fake and he really wants to know the spot and when this incident like occurred. Um, and he's he's such a, a like gung ho about it that he actually ends up losing his seat because it's so unpopular. His nationalism is such a big deal, um, even in the United States. And we want to you know also um, do this. And so we're using this international incident as a way to kind of make war on Mexico. Um, so he ends up losing his seat. Um, I bring this up because you've heard of this person before. It's Abraham Lincoln. Um, he's going to end up uh, kind of affecting U.S. politics a little bit later on. Um, and Honest Abe, as he's um, often called, um, is the one who says, you know, hey, maybe, maybe we did fake this incident even back in the day. Um, but this incident. Um, where there's supposed skirmish on American soil by Mexican troops, which probably never happened, um, though we can't prove it one way or the other, causes the United States to clear war on Mexico, kick Mexico's but up one side and down the other, um, led by Zachary Taylor, including a like raid and capture of Mexico City. And at the end, um, Mexico ends up having to cede. This is literally how we get almost all of the American Southwest. Um, Mexico has to cede um, all our parts of current day Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, Nevada, Colorado, California to the United States. It makes the United States a significantly larger country. It takes a ton of territory away from Mexico. Um, the United States will slowly start to incorporate a bunch of those places. Um, um, and take a ton of power later. And I'll be honest, guys, it's one of those things that um, that um, people look back on historically and culturally and, and begin to see the United States as a little bit of kind of a bully in the American hemisphere of things in this way, if this makes sense. Meanwhile, though, meanwhile, because of this beating beatdown, Santa Ana the Caudillo is kicked out of um of mexican politics and it leads to a sweep of liberalism and the rise of this dude by the name of benito juarez um who's going to be um probably the greatest president in mexican history or generally considered that and generally considered to be kind of like the i don't know if it's the lincoln of mexico i don't know if that's the best comparison but but something along those lines if that makes sense um and uh he's actually a, a mestizo um from rural mexico um who self-educated and becomes to be accepted by the upper middle classes he's uh he's darker skinned he actually like feels like he has to pass and stuff like that at this time which he definitely would have had to we're talking about the 1860s and he's famous for taking like rice powder and right and putting it on like his hands and face so that he'd look a little bit lighter so that people would think he was white enough because that would have been really important for him to be able to come 
become president of Mexico. And he kind of works his way up through Mexican politics at this point and seeing that like, you know, it's falling and seeing that he wants to help the people in the lower classes, he uses the Mexican-American War as a way to win elections and begin to take power and he becomes president of Mexico. Um, <clears throat> for a series of time, and he passes um, a number of laws that actually really try to help the people. Um, uh, those are things like the uh, Wardo and uh, Lerez, uh, sorry, I said that backwards. Um, Lerdo and Juarez laws, um, which curb the power of the church and curb the power of military um, and corruption and stuff like that. They take away a number of church land, like the church owns about 25% of land in Mexico, and this takes it down about 5%, redistributes that land to the people, um, et cetera, et cetera. Juarez is actually super, super popular. Um, the, un the, the conservative Creoles, though, at the same time, um, they uh, they are not happy about this in the slightest, and they uh, they actually go over to if you remember back to that um, article on eighteen forty eight revolutions, um, they go over to um, Napoleon Bonaparte in France, um, and Napoleon had married into this family. Napoleon is, is the older one um, had married into this family called the Habsburgs. The Habsburgs were one of the oldest and most powerful families in Europe that controlled large swaths of territory in Spain and Central Europe and stuff like that, the Netherlands and blah blah blah, um, and. And, uh, and um, the conservatives in Mexico make contact with Napoleon III, who is a Habsburg at this point. Um, and they basically say, you know, hey, if we'll back you if you'll um, send somebody over to help grab Mexico um, in a coup and help get rid of uh, this uh, this Benito Juarez character. Um, and, uh, and Napoleon talks to his cousin, a dude by the name of Maximilian, who's also a Habsburg, and Maximilian, who knows absolutely nothing about Mexico, doesn't speak any Spanish, but shows up in full sombrero, I'm not joking about this, when he first arrives and tries to give a speech where he's kind of mocked by the people, um, comes over and claims that, like, you know, he has, like, Napoleon's army here, and he's going to, like, you know, um, become the emperor of Mexico and, like, you know, return, like, you know, order and stuff like that and blah, blah, blah. Um, Juarez fights and runs, and things aren't going very well for a while. Now, if you look at the dates, you might notice that, like, in the early 1860s when this is happening, um, the United States is kind of wrapped up in its own thing called the Civil War. Um, so, like, Juarez kind of has to fight a guerrilla war for a while, but um, Americans, if they have one thing in common, have never really liked having um, monarchies for the most part near them or around them or anything like that. And so once the U.S. Civil War ends um, and Napoleon III of France is trying to make trouble in the United States' backyard, um, and um, uh, Mexico has become an emperor, empi emperor, nah, empire, supposedly, and stuff like that. Um, Juarez is finally able to get some help from the United States. Um, he retakes power, and they actually captures and then um, shoots um, Maximilian um, and and um, takes back control of Mexico um, and ends up as, like, you know, the kind of, like, savior of the second part of the country as he then becomes president again and in, into the 1870s or so at this point. Um, if you look right here on the right, this is the, the, the picture of Benito Juarez right there. Um, and on the left would be um, Maximilian, the one who was the Habsburg, who ended up getting um, executed at the end, but th did show up in full sombrero, claiming to be emperor of Mexico and know absolutely nothing about it. Guys, this really speaks to much like some of the stuff that comes up in other parts of European history, you know, dividing up continents or countries without talking to people there, or like, you know, um, only like reinstituting conservative rule at the Congress of Vienna, even though there have been some major changes during the French Revolution and stuff like that. This really kind of speaks to like other examples of like European like you know misunderstanding or ineptitude that led to like massive discontent and problems on a lot of people's um, sides okay so where does all this leave us after like a volatile like first half of the 19th century well um, the, the end result is that, like, you know, having seen the rise of Caudillos, having seen, like, problems in Mexico um, and pretty much every state, and, and, and not that there aren't problems in Cuba and Brazil, I was going to say every state but Cuba and Brazil, they're their own unique problems because they didn't have the various revolutions and stuff like that, um, the tide begins to change in favor of liberalism. Like, it gets to the point that, like, you know, um, like, even rigging votes, like, actually won't help. And by liberalism, I mean, I mean a number of different things. I mean, I mean, somewhat helping the lower classes and stuff like that. I I also mean stuff like free trade. I also mean like looking more to Europe as like, you know, um, the like ideas of like forwardness and like how things can be better through industrialism and stuff like that. And part of this is a, is a pendulum swing, as I said a second ago.
Um, part of this is because Europeans um, saw Latin America as, as a market for their like increased um, mass produced goods. You know, we talked about consumerism and stuff like that. Um, and Europeans um, didn't feel that, that that Asians and Africans were quote unquote ready for their goods um, thanks to racism and stuff like that. They already exported them to North America, like, you know, Europe and, or, sorry, not North America, sorry. I meant uh, basically uh, United States and Canada. Um, and so they saw the next open part as, as Latin America, like, you know, basically Mexico, like on, on, on South, etc. Etc. Et um, and so part of it was that too was there was a there was an increase like look to Europe as a result and so like liberalism because conservatism has not looked to that conservatism had tried to look inward etc cetera, etc cetera, um, during this time so liberalism um, said like you know let's look that way and and the other thing is that conservatism had failed to like kind of bring much of a lifestyle change to the lower classes so like the end result was that they had said like okay the liberals failed with this blah blah blah. Now the conservatives are going to come in and make sure that the mestizo classes, the like, you know, because they still have that caste system and that hierarchy in, in place, and mestizo classes on down the indigenous peoples, um, the the Africans that are there, the like Africans that were, were brought there, etc. All those people um, would have a better life, and and that failed. That failed under early liberalism. It failed under conservatism, and now the second wave of liberalism is going to come in, and they're going to try to bring in infrastructure um, to a large places in Latin America, and this works better in some places than others it, it, it works really well in places like argentina it doesn't work well in brazil but as i said brazil has its own separate things it works okay in colombia and venezuela um in mexico there are a number of different issues that like lead to more kind of land grabs and, and mexico is always going to have major land problems um this is usually based on around how do we get raw materials from latin america to europe so like for example we've got like you know um uh i don't know like you know uh, timber in this place and we need to figure out how to get it back to Buenos Aires so we can ship it over or back to Montevideo or something along those lines um, and so therefore we're going to build um, railroads from here to there um, and we're then going to bring it back and we're going to ship it over to Europe in order to be able to like make all the things we want out of that etc etc um, factory production raw materials um, in Latin America is still very rare um, but the better part is like in, in order to be able to move those goods around like liberalism does bring some type of infrastructure and some type of technology during this point in the middle part of the century um, to Latin America and all this is done under the uh, new mantra of the day which is progress okay and progress with a capital P so the point that it even makes its way onto the Brazilian flag if you look at it it's got that globe and it says uh, order and progress in, in Portuguese um, because progress becomes the the thing that they're going to say is, okay, we need to break free of all these things. We need to get um, things forward. We need to make sure that we're part of the world, we being Latin America, in all these cases, like the Latin America as a, as a overarching thing. Um, and therefore, we're going to denounce Cardio Ru. We're going to look to European ideas. Anything that happened in the past is bad. Anything that happens in the future is good. Um, and this is going to be led by a dude by the name of D.F. Sarmiento. Um, he's going to be the kind of like, you know, uh, person that pushes progress forward throughout the, the, the continent like crazy. He's an Argentinian president um, for a while. Um, and, uh, and, and, and we'll actually... Yeah, I'll get to Sarmiento in a second. Um, anyway, the end result of all this is that it actually doesn't make a huge difference for the bulk of the people. The upper middle class gets richer. They they get more educated. They do begin to build a better infrastructure, um, bigger cities, found universities, um, build like fire and police stations, hospitals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All that's from the picture of Buenos Aires I showed you earlier, uh, the one in gray at the very beginning. Um, uh, but the others really don't, right? Um, and here is, uh, is Sarmiento right here. Um, there's a picture of Sarmiento in Argentina's National Museum down in the bottom right. Um, but the, uh, and, and there's a picture of one of the books or one of his diaries right there at, at the bottom. But the other two things are taken from um, his tomb in, in Recoleta Cemetery in Buenos Aires. Um, and it really is like the like highlight of that area. Like he has, I mean, like every award possible, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and like this idea of like, oh, Sarmiento knows exactly what he's talking about and blah, blah, blah. And, and if, if you have at this point by the time you're listening to this um, you're going to read um, a couple commentaries he had on Cadillos and stuff along those lines and and the commentaries and ideas are really really good um, the for, as far as like you know trying to get rid of some of the older ideas and bring um, Argentina into the future the problem is that like it it kind of 
ignores other people. So those that don't agree with his ideas of progress and don't and don't buy into them and don't have the access and resources to education and progress, which Sarmiento wants to put forward. And he does educate large parts of, of Argentina on the whole. I can't speak to other parts of Latin America. I'm just talking about about uh, Sarmiento and Argentina here. Um, but like, um, is it doesn't it doesn't educate the 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 indigenous peoples? It doesn't educate like those that are not in the cities. It doesn't educate the the lower classes and poorer classes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And as a matter of fact, um, what we're gonna see is that like you know after progress kind of works and kind of doesn't, um, they're gonna be kind of a series of wars that remake the country and a series or not the country, sorry, the continent, um, in, including Argentina because the country as well, um, that remake the continent and um, a series of wars that kind of like change how um, the powers kind of deal with uh, the native populations and stuff along those lines too. Um, so as I said, you've got you've got two wars at this point that are really fought over like territory, land, and natural resources, um, and this is really um, the the end result of these ideas of progress. So like you know, a number of different countries have been like you know kind of putting forward ideas of like you know progress and forward movement, but they're all kind of bumping up heads against each other, um, and because of like you know. Um, Because of the ability of the upper middle classes to and the people in power to continue to get rich over this, it's gonna it's gonna lead to like kind of butting heads if that makes sense. Um, the first is something called the Triple Alliance War, and it's called the Triple Alliance War because it's Paraguay, which at the time is a very large country and has uh, land on the coast and stuff like that, um, versus Argentina, Brazil, and Uruguay, and that's the uh, the Triple Alliance part of it. This is actually the bloodiest war fought on the on the South American continent. Um, Paraguay had a a, a dictator that may or may not have been insane. He probably was insane um, by the end of it, but at the start of it, he was like trying to do some things that were somewhat positive for the country. But then he ended up going to violent, and then he had kind of a power move and and got kind of like you know obsessed with the power, if that makes sense. And what happened is is that by uh, 1865 you've got like rifles and the ability to mow down people really quickly rather than muskets which were not these very accurate guns um but they didn't know how to actually like you know defend against that very well later on they'll build trenches and stuff along those lines to stop it and so the end result is that there is an astronomically high death rate in argentina brazil and uruguay a uh, slaughter depending on the the um uh uh, sources you read between 70 to 85 percent of the Paraguayan male population it's astronomically bloody um, and it allows them really to grab like uh, large swaths of what have been Paraguay um, make it kind of a la landlocked country um, really kind of upset the lower classes who felt like uh, uh, cannon fodder at this point um, and this really uh, solidifies Argentina as like the power in Latin America at this point, like in the, especially in the southern part of Latin America, like Mexico might be the power up top. Um, Brazil has some things going for it, but we'll talk about it like really isn't as strong as it should be. And Argentina really has like the massive like army and the ability to grow large parts of the continent. Um, this leads to the idea of Argentinian exceptionalism in the 20th century. And as you can kind of tell throughout the course of this lecture, we're going to be really talking about Argentina more and more because it really becomes like the like dominant country in the southern part of Latin America for an extended period of time. Um, and so Argentinian exceptionalism and, and, and the, 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 it, at one point, if you can imagine this, the, there's literally this idea put forward that Argentina needs to basically save the world, and this is in the 1970s or so. And so, like, the, Argentina gets gets more and more powerful in South America and gets more and more prominent and stuff like that. And the end result um, is 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 interesting, if that makes sense. And what we'll get there further on, I don't want to don't want to talk about it too much. But my point on this is this this begins this war begins to solidify Argentina as the power in that point, and it leads to a a, a dude by the name of Julio uh, Roca who we'll talk about, um, who then um, takes that power in Argentina's newfound lands and stuff like that. And, and, and Paraguay is now, um, as I said, landlocked and has no coast. Brazil, Uruguay, Argentina um, divide up large swaths of it. Um, and he used it to um, conquer and subjugate much of the native population of Patagonia. And um, after we're done with this part of it, one of the things we're going to look at as a class is like how 
um, Brazil, Mexico, and Argentina all dealt with like kind of their native populations during this time because it's very different and it'll also be like something to compare to like kind of how the U.S. dealt with it during that time. But uh, it basically leads to uh, to 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 more or less a genocide, for lack of a better word. I mean, it, no, actually, it is flat out genocide. Let's not really mince words on this. Um, meanwhile, um, uh, about um, nine years later, um, a, a very similar thing happens between Chile and Paraguay, and um, Paraguay ends up losing another large swath of its west coast and this is the thing that fully landslocks is on the other side um and chile now um is able to grab this long kind of if you ever looked at a map it's this long slender country that just goes all the way up the the west coast of 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 south america if that makes sense and it's this war of the pacific that um chile's navy is able to dominate um uh paraguay's navy because paraguay did have a navy at that point it wasn't landlocked in fully um and uh and and take them down and and what this does is it gives um chile a large swath of natural resources down at the southern tip of south america um which allows them like oil and stuff along those lines and this will kind of fund a very liberal government um, for the uh, next 40 years or so. Um, and if you look right here, the guy in the center is is the president of Argentina at that time, Julio Roca, who, um, uh, as I said, um, slaughtered uh, large swaths of, uh, of um, the natives during that um, time. Um, you can see there, it's interesting, Argentina kind of has a love-hate relationship with it. You've got um, some things on the side that looks very much like the Washington Monument on the left, and then you can see it kind of inscribed there where it kind of gives props to Roca for his, his president, um, president, ah, sorry, presidency and, and what he did to expand Argentina during that time, during the war, etc., etc. Yet on the other hand, and you can see even in the museum um, that I've talked about a couple times, you got like a you know, sword and like some of the other things that came up um, with that. But, uh, but you know, for a while, and this is really interesting because you could compare this to someone like Andrew Jackson, who, who had did a similar thing in the United States um, to, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, move and, and not, well, maybe genocide against, uh, I'd say it's genocide against large, it tried to commit genocide against large swaths of, of the Native American population in the United States. Um, and, you know, Roca was on the uh, 10,000 uh, peso, Argentinian 10,000 peso note, um, which is kind of the Argentinian equivalent of the $20 bill, and kind of like Jackson's on it. And, um, you know, within the last 10 years, he was removed and replaced with uh, Evita, um, who's the uh, wife of uh, Juan Perón, who was one of the more famous women in Argentinian history. Um, because of some of the crimes committed here and stuff like that. This is something we'll talk about some in class. Um, and so it's just interesting to see, like, yes, they, they still have the monument supporting him, but on the other hand, they removed him from the note. Like, you know, there's not a monument supporting Jackson, but on the other hand, we still have Jackson on our notes. And so as a result, like, you know, it kind of gives you an interesting, like, perspective on, on both countries' like relationship and how they deal with the history. Okay. So the last couple things we need to talk about, because I've mentioned this a couple times during the course of this, is kind of the differences in what happened in both um, Brazil and Cuba. And we'll talk about Brazil and Cuba, because remember, Brazil didn't have a massive revolution. It instead had a, like, you know, Portuguese king come over and claim to be Brazilian. And Cuba was the one country that was not, um, uh, you know, actually... Um, uh, free after 1830. So we'll talk about those two and then we'll kind of wrap it up with one slide at the very end or so. Um, so to talk about kind of Brazil's different path, um, as I said, it, it's the one thing where nothing changed. First, they had, um, you know, uh, they were, they claimed to be, um, you know, part of, um, uh, the Portuguese Empire, and then they broke away, and they had Pedro the First and Pedro the Second, and like, um, basically they they never had a light an enlightenment. They had really, really, really tight relations between church and state. Um, they had a bunch of people who said, "Hey, we should break away from that," but then they really wanted to make more money, and those people could never really support either of the Pedros, and so the end result was that they still had slavery. They still had a huge like you know hierarchical caste system. Um, and they still had plantations and, and stuff along those lines. And for a while, this worked really, really well for Brazil. Uh, Brazil was making tons of money. Um, they uh, and, and Brazil always, and this is what you see throughout the course of Latin American history, always has a slightly different path from the rest of the country. Or the rest, of, sorry, not the rest of the country, geez. Uh, the rest of the continent, never mind. Um, anyway, um, 
Brazil, uh, Brazil, um, they, they had plantations, um, they had escaped violence, uh, these plantations had very low labor costs because of slavery, they were still using that, that system um, in the 1840s, uh, very similar to like the United States South and stuff along those lines, and, and, and by that time, they're literally producing two-thirds of the world's uh, coffee, um, but, uh, you know, there, there's, there's some problems and there's some issues and stuff along those lines. Um, and this kind of like slowly continues from the 1840s, like, you know, because again, the people want to make money. So, you know, you make two thirds of the world coffee and like, you know, you're going to make a lot of money. And so everybody's like, well, we want to get rid of slavery. There've been some republics like, you know, where slaves have revolted. There've been some like, you know, fighting, et cetera, et cetera, but we're making a lot of money. So we don't want to like really deal with that, like blah, blah, blah. Um, and, uh, and, and right around the time that like... It seems like, you know, there might be, like, a big push. Um, there's this there's this kind of huge, like, you know, uh, stop in Brazilian society. And, and, and the liberals and the conservatives <coughs> lock ranks, and they put down um, any slave insurrection that stops and stuff along those lines. And it makes sure that Brazil stays an empire for another generation or so. And it's not going to be until the 1880s, 1888, that Brazil will finally fully outlaw slavery. They'll do a number of things like, you know, hey, people who are slaves now are still slaves, but people who are born into slavery are not slaves and stuff like that. And it's really going to be the Triple Alliance War and people seeing the, like, massive killing and the fact that, like, you know, that people are being fed first slaves and then other non-slaves, like, you know, mestizos and lower class, like, you know, Creoles and indigenous people and stuff along those lines are basically being kind of like, you know, used as, as cannon fodder and stuff along those lines. And this will, uh, this will cause people to kind of start to like rebel and not rebel, like, you know, hardcore, but rebel socially in Brazil and be like, we really need to change this. We really need to get rid of like, uh, the idea of an empire, we need to really get rid of a king, and and so finally in 1888, um, Brazil will, as I said earlier, outlaw slavery, um, and that really causes like a huge economic collapse because the people up top, the people that Pedro had uh, had supported Pedro and Pedro had supported the people that claimed they wanted to get rid of this but never did because of money, like all lose tons of money at this point, right? And they lose land and like they end up having to sell and stuff like that, and within a year, the entire thing is collapse pedro the second actually goes back to portugal and just kind of becomes like a, a small part of the portuguese like royal family and stuff like that and the empire falls and like brazil becomes a republic by november of like 1889 and so by 1889 you've got literally all of south america like at least quote unquote free slash you know some type of like democratic republic etc etc it doesn't mean it'll stay that way Um, meanwhile, the last place I want to talk about in this kind of long thing is Cuba, because like, you know, uh, starting in 1868, um, there had been a, a series of wars of independence for Cuba. And if you remember, Cuba was the only place that really hadn't been free. And there had been large debates about what to do with it. It's, it's 90 miles off the coast of Florida. Um, it, it's always actually, you know, people think like, oh, Cuba is like this closed off place at this point. Like it really never was and until, until the Castros in, in, in 59 and stuff like that, like fully came, um, to take control of the island. Like Cuba was like one of the hottest tourist destinations in America. And by the way, I'd, I'd highly recommend if you get the chance to go because people think it's not illegal to go, or if people think it's illegal to go to Cuba and you can't go, no, you know, you can go to Cuba. Like, you know, um, it's, it's, it's actually very, very interesting. And it'll teach you an interesting thing about like, you know, the history of the Americas, if that makes sense. Um, but there, there, we'll talk way, way, way more about that later. Um, anyway, as I was saying, um, Cuba was the only country that was technically not freed um, from Europe by 1830, and um, uh, it was the it was the it, first one that that changed very 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 little. Um, Spain, like, you know, took direct control for a long period of time. Like, finally they gave it a colonial governor, finally did a few more things. And, and it's actually the second to last place to, to outlaw slavery in 1886, um, in the Americas. Um, and, and by that, the, the, as I said, by Brazil, the whole continent has, but Cuba's the place right before that. However, there, and, and we'll talk about this, um, uh, kind of both personally and with stuff later on, 
Um, there is a uh, there is a really interesting result of that because there is a large what we call Afro Cuban population um, that makes up Cuba that like you know um, I think it's about a third of the country that has historically been marginalized and actually like one of the reasons that communism has been somewhat popular in Cuba is that 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 stopped that once like the Castro's came to power and stuff like that. Um, I'm not saying that, that that makes everything better. I'm just saying that's an interesting like kind of counter perspective um, to what people necessarily think about the response of that. Um, anyway, um, Spain makes a few moves. There's, as I said, a few um, wars of independence and stuff like that, but the real insurrection really begins in 1895, okay? And it begins with a proclamation um, uh, by a dude by the name of Jose Marti, okay? And uh, I think I mentioned earlier, I said when, when Matheny and I were in Cuba, we saw the, the what they claimed to be the four liberators of America, and you made your way through all four of them. One was Simone Bolivar, two was Abraham Lincoln, three was Benito Juarez, who we talked about earlier, and the last one was Jose Marti. I'm not saying I agree with that. I just thought that it was an interesting perspective. Um, and Marti is literally the national hero of Cuba. It is impossible to turn around in Havana these days and not run into a statue of Marti. I mean, you'll be like walking by the side of the road and be like, oh, there's a little statue. Oh, that's Marti. Of course not. The whole airport's named after him, etc., etc. And so in 1895, Marti gets up and he says, you know, hey, we're, we're going to rebel against um, uh, um, Spain. Um, and uh, we're going to do it under the following um, conditions. One, uh, the war will be waged by everybody. Blacks, whites, Afro-Cubans, that's why I talked about it earlier. Like, everybody will be involved in this. Um, and so as a result, we're going to need everybody then, and for the most part, people agree with him. Um, uh, two, um, Spaniards who do not object to the war would be spared. So, like, for example, if you say, all right, cool, I'll be with you guys at this point, like, even though I'm a peninsula, like, I'm good. And, and, and that works fairly well. And three, economic life should be brought to Cuba. So the goal is to bring, like, you know, some type of, like, sustenance to the island that doesn't just involve, like, Spanish sugar plantations, which is what it really mostly was at this point. Um, and Marti, who's a poet, also um, found something called All Our America. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll read part of this now, and then we'll read it again later, because it'll be something that'll be really, really key for... Um, the Latin American nationalist movement in the 1940s, uh, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, and on, and stuff like that. And the Our American movement, which I've referenced a few times, basically argues, as I've said, and Marty uses the word slave, though I don't love it, that Europeans have been slaves to Latin America, or sorry, that Latin Americans have been slaves to European economics, culture, politics, ideas, like everything, like right down to like how they dress, blah, 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 blah. And they need to found their own unique culture um and their own unique ideas and their own unique like you know um life and continent etc etc and if they can do that then like they will have a successful like uh political economic and fulfilling like you know life blah blah, blah is what marty argues um and this will be something that will resonate all the way down through through um people like vargas through people like castro as i mentioned through che um through like you know even even later on to the kirchners and, and uh um lulu and brazil and stuff along those lines okay um on top of that uh marty is going to be killed during uh one of these key battles in 1895 which is going to elevate him to like you know martyr status right um and uh, this is really going to make him kind of, as I said, the key guy. Um, not everything will work out perfectly for the, the Cubans fighting in this. And actually, it's going to take the help of the United States, um, kind of, um, under, again, dubious circumstances. We may or may not have faked a, a bombing or something along those lines um, to give us mild pretext for war. Um, but the end result is that we're going to claim that the USS Maine blew up in Havana Harbor, um, thanks to the Spanish, and this, therefore we need to help um, the Cubans and other parts of the Spanish Empire and stuff along those lines. And the end result is that um, the United States is going to take down a 500-year-old empire in about 17 weeks. Um, and it's going to promise at that point to, to give Cuba and, and those people independence because it really kind of jumped in and helped out with that. Um, and this is really in the middle of the, the Cuban um, the liberation. That's why it's in, in quotes above for Cuba. Um, but it's never really going to fully do that. And so Cuba's, as a result of this whole thing, going to kind of remain a client state um, until uh, the Castro and others um, take over the land in 1953. Um, if we look like here, uh, here are actually like some statues and pictures of Marti um, that I was talking about. This is in the Independence Square, or Revolution Square, as it's now called. Um, this was actually not even built by Castro. It was built earlier by his predecessor, uh, 
Batista. Um, but this is Marty right here, and this is him, like, you know, um, uh, uh, in front of the Cuban flag, and this is the monument to the revolution of the Cuban people. This is actually called the Death of Marty. This is actually in the middle of Havana. You can find it in the square. It's one of the more famous sculptures there. And this is a more modern uh, take of Marty, which is outside the Museum of the Revolution. As I said, he is literally, like, there are little busts of this guy all over Havana. It's kind of fascinating. Okay, so now that we've, you know, kind of seen, like, the explorations and movements on the continent throughout, like, you know, the 19th century, um, what ends up ha happening to Latin America? Well, the end result is something called the Great Export Boom, okay? Um, and this is a, a huge period of economic growth, and it's really interesting because, like, it helps out large, large, large swaths of the continent and the... And the um, of the area, et cetera, et cetera, but it, it doesn't help out the lowest of the lowest classes. It does lead to the rise of the middle class. Um, it's basically the sustained period of economic growth where, like, you know, the ideas of progress and the rush for resources leads to, like, a massive, massive um, move to, like, export things. And, like, it'll actually be interesting because Latin America will export so much that then when the Great Depression becomes, they've exported so much that they're like, you know, maybe we should do stuff in here. And they're actually the one area of the world to avoid a depression during the Great Depression. Um, and so actually from 1870 all the way through 1950 or so, you have massive periods periods of economic growth. This is just the first part of the great export boom from 1870 to 1930. Um, to give you an idea, Mexican trade grew 900%. Um, as we talked about, Brazil um, exported uh, two-thirds of the world's coffee. Argentinian wheat um, during that time from in those 60 periods, that production is a 60 years, sorry. Um, the production increased a, a thousandfold. I mean, like, so they are literally like, you know, um, bringing i mean if you t if you follow adam smith's like theories of capitalism and stuff like that the more money you're bringing in everybody gets richer etc etc and it works to a certain extent it leads to a massive rise of the middle class it does lead to a still like you know impoverished lower class like this is where like you know shadan's kids are still like having issues because like they haven't had the full revolution but like you know some of them might have made it to the middle class and been okay right um railroad track goes from about two thousand miles um to fifty nine thousand miles and just 30 years which is is fairly kind of amazing um aside from about four or five cities uh, uh rio uh buenos aires uh caracas uh mexico city um and i think that's about the list like there might be one that i'm forgetting or so in there um there's there's really not much like factory production this is still like a massive like let's harvest natural resources and export them but like it's 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 a mild it's a stepping stone in the move towards like you know um uh uh more equality and more rights for everybody if that makes sense okay now having said this all of this really really hurts hurts small farmers and people who are not able to keep up like you know um large swaths of people are kicked off their land in the name of progress in order to make room for like you know these larger farms or these bigger things and stuff like this and this is why they said there are limitations of progress by 1910 um uh three percent of mexicans actually owned all the land um if you fall into the other 97 percent, you have no chance of owning land whatsoever and you're forced into like small sharecropping areas um or as we also talked about people like you know julio roca um also like you know and other, like, we'll also talk about it in Brazil and Argentina and stuff like that, and Cuba, too. Um, uh, it really kind of impact and, like, go after indigenous people and, and supposedly uh, clear them out slash commit genocide in the name of, like, you know, uh, um, getting more land and more natural resources and stuff along those lines. Um, the other thing that happens a lot during this time is that the countries that can't necessarily that aren't as big, like, not the Argentinas, not the Brazils, not the Mexicos, but more like the Dominican Republics, the Costa Ricas, et cetera, et cetera, um, they might have like, you know, one, uh, resource that exports them really, really well. And in order to make that work, um, for their country, uh, some, uh, usually corrupt president will allow a corporation to come in and set up things and they'll kind of abuse the lower part of the population, um, and make them pay high taxes while giving a lot of stuff to the higher population, exporting things for really, really cheap. Um, and, um, uh, what was I going to say, and then kind of kicking back to, like, the people in charge. Um, the classic example of this actually occurs not in the, um, uh, 
uh, what was I going to say? Not in, in, in Latin America, but in the Pacific, which would be like the U.S. has kind of dealings with Hawaii's and the Dole Corporation in Hawaii and stuff like that. Um, and the end result is these take the names Banana Republics. It's not just a clothing store, people. Um, they're, uh, they're things that are set up based on around one, as I said, one corporation or one uh, commodity that then like, you know, um, yeah, the, the entire country is based around and large swaths of the population are made to, to work cheaply while other people get rich in order to keep like, you know, prices down very low. And, and as I said, Dole, um, with like, you know, fruit in Hawaii and stuff like that, United Fruit in Cuba is another example of that. Um, you have examples, uh, uh, later on in, uh, Dominican Republic, um, in, uh, Costa Rica and Guatemala and, and, and stuff like that. All of these things will be kind of like set up and dominated by outside influences, um, usually like United States corporations or stuff like that, um, which will like be kind of the limits of the great export boom. In other words, it'll look like that they're making tons of money and stuff like that, but in all honesty, like as I said, the, the lower classes and stuff like that are not doing as well. And the end result is that all this starts to dub with like Victorian values and gender roles and social Darwinism, and it leads to ideas of neocolonialism, as we'll talk about like later on in this unit. Like the idea Idea that like you know basically European and American corporations and and peoples and influences and stuff like that really take a large influence in the overarching like uh, politics and government and therefore economics of, of a large number of Latin American countries um, and 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 don't really like fully colonize them again but you to Jiminy and soft power to kind of take control which is known as kind of neo-colonialism and because they say like well you know we're European and you're Latin American so therefore we're superior like under ideas of social Darwinism which I know you guys talked about last year etc cetera, etc cetera, um, it works in Europe and it leads to a lot of tensions between like kind of the two continents all right, y'all, I know this has been like kind of a long lecture because we needed to get through like, as I said, an almost an entire century during the course of this. Um, but uh, this kind of like concludes what I wanted to talk about in 19th century Latin America. As, as I said, we'll break it up. We'll, we'll talk about it um, a number of times, but this will be kind of the overarching like overview for those of you that either can't make it asynchronously or want to review or stuff along those lines. Uh, email me if you have any questions and I'll talk to you guys soon.